Okay, well, good evening. Um, my name is Hugh White. I'm Professor of Strategic Studies at ANU, and I can still say that in a couple of weeks I'm still, still the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies. Um, and it's a very great pleasure uh, this evening to welcome you all here to this uh, ANU public lecture and to introduce uh, my old friend and colleague and indeed predecessor as head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, Professor Paul Thibb. Um, of course, it's kind of a cliche, but Paul really is one of those people who don't need any introduction, but I'm not going to let him get away with that with any introduction anyway. Most people in Australia, and most people uh, under about my age, I guess, when they think of Paul Dibb, they think of Australian defence policy. And there's a reason for that. If you look at the jobs that Paul has had in the last 25 years, going back through uh, Professor Emeritus, Head of the Strategic Defence Studies Centre, Deputy Secretary of Strategy and Intelligence, Director of the Defence Intelligence Organisation, uh, Principal Author of the 1987 White Paper and the author of the Dib Review, which does get us back 25 years. Um, Paul has been absolutely at the centre of a long series of debates about the way in which Australia thinks about defence policy, the way we think about armed force. Um, and the way we look at the kinds of armed forces we need to achieve our strategic objectives in this country. And in that capacity, I, it's simply true to say that Paul has made as big a contribution, I think arguably a bigger contribution, to the way in which Australia thinks about defence policy uh, than as anyone in the history of, uh, uh, of the Commonwealth, which now is addressing back uh, in 10 years. It's a remarkable set of achievements and career. But long before we got interested in Australian defence policy, Paul's real love, his first love, intellectually I may say, and his great contribution was as an expert on the Soviet Union and as a practitioner not of the business of policy but of the business of intelligence assessment. Well, for several decades Paul was uh, absolutely at the forefront of uh, intelligence assessment in this country. He was at a very young age, he became the head of the National Assessment Staff, which was, potatoes me and a kind of predecessor of ONA, and played uh, a very leading role in the assessments that Australia, uh, Australian government made and had available to it on uh, Australia's evolving international strategic environment. And within that business, he had a particular focus on, on the Soviet Union. And in that capacity, he became a very significant figure in the global industry of assessing the Soviet Union, which was, of course, during the Cold War, a really, really big industry and very important industry indeed. And it's um, been, I think, one of his pleasures over the last few years and one of uh, my pleasures, and I'm sure it's the pleasure of all many other friends, to see him over the last few years go back to Russia, I mean, literally, physically, but also, so to speak, intellectually, to re-explore some of those questions uh, that he worked on uh, in the, the time of the Soviet Union um, and to come back as he will with us tonight to the fascinating question which brings together his interest in the intelligence business and his interests in the Soviet Union that is why did we get it wrong. Uh, but being Paul of course I'm sure he won't just dwell in the past but he'll also bring this story up to date and ask what we can learn about some very big questions we face today by looking back at uh, the story of the Soviet Union and how we saw what was happening there in the years up to its collapse just over 20 years ago. Uh, so Paul speak for about 20 minutes, um, uh, 40 minutes rather, and then uh, we'll have some time for Q&A and we'll try and wrap things up by 7 o'clock. Uh, thanks to Garth and the team for putting this together. Uh, and for our new ads, I must say, a very flash. Um, uh, a very fitting um, a backdrop for your, for your observations, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hugh. You're, you're most generous, and uh, our friendship goes back a very long way. Um, and Hugh, if I might, in semi-public, take this opportunity to thank you for your last, your last seven years as head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre and the enormous uh, 
uh, effort and sterling work and profile we brought to the center. The center, as you know, has changed out of sight in terms of uh, the size of our masters and PhD programs and now our undergraduate teaching and, and not least um, the new contract we've won uh, over at Muslim Creek. Uh, so thank you again. I know we'll have better occasions to do this over the odd drink or two. Um, so as Hugh says, my, my career basically, both academically, and this is the third time I've been at this university. Uh, I started off in 1968 in another research school uh, in the political science department under Professor Harry Rigby, who was the solid expert in Australia, and who the CIA ranked in the top seven or ten in the world. And we forget at that time we had at this university and in these research schools some of the leading experts uh, on the Soviet Union. So half of my life uh, was on the Soviet Union and uh, when uh, uh, Hughes boss and mine, uh, one uh, defence minister, uh, Kim Beasley, rang me up uh, in late 1984 and said, oh, I've got a serious problem in the Department of Defence, they can't agree on the time of day would you come as ministerial consultant and completely review the Australian uh, Defence Force military capabilities? And I must say, before I thought about it and later on said yes, that the thought did cross my mind. Uh, this minister is asking me to stop studying a country, the Soviet Union, with 12,000 strategic nuclear warheads. 200 divisions, 50,000 tanks, 5,000 combat aircraft, 280 submarines, and 300 surface combatants for a defense force of 72,000, six battalions, 100 tanks, <laughs> and six submarines. Uh, but yes, we, we did it and we, we uh, changed our career um, fortuitously in 1985, uh, just before the, uh, the Soviet Union um, did a collapse. I am to th this evening going to focus more on trends than events. It is not part of my purpose here this evening to criticise those both in <coughs> intelligence and academia amongst the Sovietologist, Sovietologist community who got the actual collapse wrong. It is always difficult <coughs> to predict events. But my more serious purpose is to be critical of those, both um, here and most especially in the United States, who didn't get the trends right, who could not see, as early as I did in the late 70s and early 80s, that there was something very seriously wrong. And there were weaknesses, which I must say I didn't see as fatal, but in which when I wrote the book that you um, commented on for the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London, I called it the Soviet Union, the incomplete superpower. And that very title got me into severe trouble uh, with the American intelligence community. Um, and I'll leave you some sense of just how dangerous it was at the time to study the Soviet Union, it was forbidden fruit, and the enormous pressures, some of which were nasty personal pressures on me with regard to uh, not conforming to the conventional wisdom, including with regard to certain elements of the Australian intelligence community at the time. I've reminded you of, very briefly, of just how strong militarily the Soviet Union. I mean, this was a country that for the first time in America's history was capable of wiping the United States out in 24 hours back. The nuclear war uh, targeting on both sides was to reduce the, in America's case, the Soviet population by 50% in 24 hours. So you're talking about 100 million people. You know, a non-casual figure, <coughs> an extremely serious existential threat, which, frankly, the so-called war on terrorism bears no relationship to. And we've forgotten, and I think we have a generation um, uh, who naturally uh, were not brought up in this period as Ambassador, you and I were, every day of our lives in the 60s and 70s, and indeed 80s. And it's fashionable today to say, oh, it was quite a stable period, the Soviets and Americans understood the rules of the game. Well, I'm going to give you some case studies where that was not the case. 
and that never mind the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was frankly not all that serious because the Soviets had very limited nuclear capabilities. The most serious event where we teetered on the edge of global nuclear war was 1983, and I'll come back to that. I'm going to start with a couple of quotes from uh, Henry Kissinger, who you all know, and George Kennan, the American who um, developed the policy of containment of the Soviet Union. In Kissinger's book, Diplomacy, in 1994, he said, and I quote, At one moment, at the beginning of the 1980s, it was as if communist momentum might sweep all before it, and at the next moment, as history measures time, communism was self-destructive. And what he meant then, there was that um, with the American defeat in the Vietnam War in 75, the Soviets took advantage of it, they invaded <coughs> Afghanistan, with 120,000 troops in 1978, late, 78, and were there for 10 years, and lost, they admit to 15,000 dead, the real figures are more like 25,000 uh, casualties. And that the Soviet Union was taking advantage of American weakness and perceptions of American defeat at Vietnam. Uh, I recall only too well the Soviets had a the biggest naval base outside of the Warsaw Pact in Berbera, Somalia. And uh, I never went there, but I could have walked you through it blindfold because of the intelligence <laughs> access we had. Um, it had a signals intelligence station, a missile handling facility, um, airfields for um, badger bombers, and um, capabilities for both submarines and surface ships. Um, and you will remember how uh, Malcolm Fraser, that um, these days uh, well-known centre-left person was extreme hard right wing when he was Prime Minister and we had the, 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 the scare of the Soviet naval presence in the Indian, Indian Ocean. I mean the fact it was 3,000 nautical miles away uh, um, was not in perspective. And of course the Soviets were helping the Cubans to go into Angola and transporting Cuban troops into Angola. All this we forget. We have master's students now, some of whom may well be here, who are in their 20s, who say to me when I give them a talk on the former Soviet Union, Professor Dib, is there a good book on that Soviet Union place and that Cold War thing? Well, yeah, I've got several hundred, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it makes you feel like Methuselah. Kissinger also said, and I quote, no world power has ever disintegrated so totally or so rapidly without losing a war. And I want you to pause on that because I want to take you through the question, why was there not Armageddon? Why didn't the Soviet military and KGB unleash the dogs of war? Final quote is George Kennan, I mentioned him. And he says, he found it, and I quote, hard to think of any event more strange and startling than the sudden and total disintegration and disappearance of the great power known as the Soviet Union. So these are titanic events we're talking about. Although I, from the late 70s and then in this university, wrote the book that got me into trouble in America, The Incomplete Superpower, you know, not that I reread it, but I recall only too well. I knew that I was saying things that would not be approved. I was lucky that an Australian, uh, Bob O'Neill, a former head of this uh, Strategic Defence Studies Centre, was the head of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, and he put the foreword in my book and had it published, even though a lot of his funding came from the other side of the Atlantic. Um, but don't get me wrong, despite the gracious remarks of Hugh, I wasn't good enough to see that the Soviet Union might suddenly collapse. All I was saying was it had tremendous maybe fatal weaknesses as a major power and wouldn't make it as a major power. So we do need to ask, in this period under Gorbachev and his uh, perestroika and glasnost, why was it that the Soviet elite, that is the party and the Politburo, the KGB, and the armed forces, which numbered, numbered 5 million, failed to defend the Soviet state. And as I've suggested, 
equally, why didn't we see an all-encompassing conflagration even more, even a lashing out to the West uh, in one final spasm? It's a great mystery still in many ways. You've heard from Hugh my experience in the Cold War. I first went to the Soviet Union in 1968, went across Siberia. I was writing a book on that place. Um, and then as an intelligence officer, head of the National Assessment Staff, the Secretary of the Department of Defense, the famous Mandarin, um, uh, Sir Arthur Tang, uh, said to me, Dib, I want you to go to the Soviet Union in your role as head of the National Assessment Staff. Go and tell the Soviet Embassy who you are. They will be new. Um, I want an Australian view of the Soviet Union, not an American or a British one. You go and stay with that ambassador. You're not allowed to stay in a hotel. You might get grabbed. And uh, he was a very, um, very wise man in many ways. I mean, it would be interesting whether secretaries of departments these days would have that courage to do that sort of thing. And so I used to go quite regularly and have discussions with them about their strategic nuclear missiles and the balance of power in the Indian Ocean and the difference between a subsonic and a supersonic cruise missile and how it might be uh, measured in terms of arms control and so on. I came here and wrote the book in the early 80s and then, you know, the rest of the story. After I uh, had worked for Kim Beasley, um, I was appointed as... Um, director of what is now the Defence Intelligence Organisation, and I'll come back to that. And I went to CIA headquarters, where I've been many times before, to talk to one Robert Gates, who had been the National Intelligence Officer for the Soviet Union, fluent Russian linguist, unlike me, and uh, was Deputy Director of the CIA. And I'll never forget, he said to me, Paul, we've read your book, this incomplete superpower thing, you're badly wrong. This is 1980, late 86, I think, maybe early 87. You're badly wrong. We in, the agency are the, we in the agency are of the view that the Soviet Union is poised to outstrip the United States in military power. 86, 87, 89, down comes the Berlin Wall. Christmas Eve 1991, I can sing the Beatles song back in the USSR. There's one other personal anecdote, and Hugh knows that in public, I, it's not my habit, either in writing or speaking, to talk about personal issues. But this one, it's about time it was in the public domain. Before Beasley appointed me in late 84, I just finished the book and was publishing it to send it off to the IISS. And the position of director of the, what is now the Defense Intelligence Organization became vacant. So I applied, I'd been the deputy director after the National Assessment Staff was taken over by Romain. And Hugh will remember these people who interviewed me, Ron McLeod, Deputy Secretary, who later became Commonwealth Ombudsman, um, uh, Ray Fennell, Chief of the Air Force, who later became Vice Chief and then Principal of the Senior at College at Western Creek, and a Public Service Representative. And sometimes, you know, when you're interviewed for a job, you know you've done it really well. And so I was waiting for the phone call, and the phone call came from <coughs> Sir William Cole, Secretary of the Department of Defence, former Secretary of the Treasury, former Chairman of the Public Service Board. Come over and see me, so I went over to see him. He said, well, you've applied for this job, and I guess you have a strong feeling that you've won it. And I sort of said, well, I thought the interview went very well. He said, well, you are the unanimous choice of the selection committee. However, the Director General of the Office of National Assessment, one Michael Cook, will not accept you because of your views on the Soviet Union. And I've never forgotten that. Four months later, I'm the senior ministerial consultant with all this huge power, uh, to be used carefully, uh, <laughs> to review the Australian military capabilities. And I go to see Sir William Cole, and he says to me, well, Paul, this is a turn up for the books. And I thought, yes, son, and the empire's going to strike back. <laughs> End of personal stories. I want to talk, uh, and I've done this before, to some of you like uh, Pete Van Ness and, uh, and uh, others here, 
including Clyde Williams, will just go to sleep while I repeat this. I just want to talk very briefly about the theory of the rise and fall of great powers and versus the Soviet model, because it doesn't fit in well. Paul Kennedy, um, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, seminal work um, uh, and still relevant, uh, stresses throughout his work the key role of economic power. With that big economic, strong economic power, you don't make it historically, whether it's the Roman Empire, um, the, the Dutch, the French, the, the Spanish, the Brits, the Americans. And of course, there's enormous truth in that. The, there's always an exception, and you can't say the Soviet Union had a big, successful economy. It was big, but it was unsuccessful. In many ways, other than its military power, my impression was, going there frequently, it was a third world country in terms of service, food supplies, infrastructure, or poverty, you name it. It is, of course, an interesting question whether it was Soviet weaknesses that helped to bring it down. And we'll come back to that. Niall Ferguson, who many of you know, argues that um, one of the key explanatory variables for the rise and fall of great powers is what he calls fiscal crises and huge public debt, something that the European Union is facing right now. <laughs> Not Sweden. Um, he quotes Imperial France as having a public debt of 62% of GDP, the Spanish Empire of having a fiscal debt of 100%. He doesn't quote the USSR, and I don't have a figure for their fiscal debt, but I can tell you what their budget deficit was. It was never, even towards the, the very final year, at more than 9%. So it was not in, in critical dire straits. The economy, you will read, is it was stagnating. Well, it was actually slowing down remarkably quickly. Growth rate in the last five years, right through to 1989, was 1.9%. <clears throat> Not the end of the world, you know? I mean, it wasn't in collapse state. Uh, Amy Chua, who's professor of law at Yale Law School, uh, in her book about empires, <coughs> talks about the role of intolerance. That tolerant societies, including the early uh, Roman Empire, and indeed, the, she would argue, the early British one, um, uh, were very tolerant societies. And as they became intolerant, the pressures of disintegration of the empire occurred. There's, 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 I suggest an issue there we need to ponder on, and that is the immorality and illegitimacy of the Soviet regime. And Gorbachev, um, in his final years, talked about not, he, he didn't want to dismantle the Soviet and the state and the Communist Party. He, he, he called it he wanted a more moral USSR, and that's a quotation, a more moral USSR. And I'll just give you a couple of other quotes which I come across. Uh, Gorbachev's Prime Minister, Nikolai Rishkov, uh, talked about, and it's a very telling quote, we stole from ourselves, took and gave bribes, lied in the reports, in newspapers from high podiums, wallowed in our lies, hung medals on one another, and all of this from top to bottom and from bottom to top. Uh, Edward Shedanadze, uh, um, Gorbachev's foreign minister, a long-serving member of the Politburo, um, uh, recalls telling Gorbachev in the winter of 1984-85, and I quote, everything is rotten, it has to be changed. So I think there's an issue there, whether we call it intolerance or simple moral decay, it was certainly an issue very much on Gorbachev's mind. You want my view very briefly? Let me tell you what I think did not cause the collapse of the USSR. It's fashionable in American circles to crow about it, but you know, we Americans forced the Soviet Union into an arms race and we broke their back. Well, it is true that um, as far as we can calculate it, the Soviet Union was spending at least 20% of GDP, maybe more, on military arms builder. And more importantly, the best scientific engineering brains were in the military establishment. They were well rewarded, they had special shops, special food, special housing. And you need to remember that in the Soviet period, as long as you weren't a political dissident, the education system was exceptionally rigorous, not least in the hard sciences, mathematics, chemistry, physics, engineering. And when you look at some of the weapon systems, not these ones that they invented, 
They were architecturally and design-wise different from Western weapon systems. Whether it was the heaviness of the ICBMs, like the SS-18, the design of very large submarines, much bigger than the American ones, or even um, uh, the development ahead of the Americans of supersonic sea skimming missiles. They were highly innovative. It's a question, frankly, whether they are now. So I don't accept the arms race, bro. I think it was a burden, but it didn't break the back. And second, the other fanciful one, and I'm sure you've heard it, is that Afghanistan broke the Soviets. It's true, you heard me say. The 40th Russian Army, Soviet Army was in there for 10 years, just like the Americans are still there now, 10 years. Remember I said 120,000 troops for 10 years, not in and out, and then trying to build up at the tail end. And you heard the fatalities I mentioned. It didn't break the back of the Russian economy. It is true it caused a lot of dissent amongst the uh, National Service compulsory um, elements in the, in the military. You've got to remember the Soviet military was a brutal, um, uh, physically offensive uh, army to its own privates and so on. But the fact is, until the Americans through the CIA brought the Stinger missiles in to bring down the very good Soviet armed, armed helicopters, the Russians were not losing. Uh, so I don't accept that one either. I want to turn now to my explanations, and these are very challengeable, as indeed this, this whole evening is. Why the methodology and epistemology of the particularly the American intelligence and academic community of Sovietologists got it wrong. Remember, I'm not talking about the events of the last couple of years of the Soviet I'm talking about de detecting the trend line uh, well before um, uh, things got bad in the Soviet Union. And you've got to remember, uh, and these are figures off the top of my head, but I think there were over 200,000 people in the United States stu studying the Soviet Union full time. The whole of the National Security Agency, that is the Electronic Interception Agency, um, uh, was studying the Soviet Union. They weren't interested in anything else. Uh, the whole of the Defense Intelligence Agency was studying the Soviet Union. They didn't study anything else. As Dwight Williams remembers that too well. The whole of the CIA. If you try to get a discussion in the CIA on Australia or Papua New Guinea or Indonesia, Paul, tell us what the Soviet embassy in Australia is doing. Or are they trying to establish an embassy in Papua New Guinea, or access to fishing ports and using hydrographic, that is, spy ships. So, you know, spit on the finger, top of the head, and of course, academics and certain universities in the United States were heavily subsidised one way or the other. Indeed, when I wrote the book, you recall, with Harry Rigby in the late 60s here on the economic development of Siberia, very sexy subject, <laughs> that money came from the Ford Foundation, and we can guess what its origins were. So you had this huge community. So what were the issues? And they go something like this. Not seeing the wood for the trees. Both in academia and in the intelligence communities, including here, uh, experts studied more and more about less and less. And look, when you've got a denied target like the Soviet Union, which had little in the way of transparency, there were forbidden cities um, you couldn't travel to. I never took a camera to the Soviet Union because you couldn't photograph people in uniform. Uh, railway viaducts, railway lines, government offices, um, road overpasses, you name it, you couldn't photograph it. And the risk, of course, was extremely high. So it was, a, don't get me wrong, a very difficult target to penetrate, uh, and particularly the military target. And so you had to get into a lot of detail. The first time I went to CIA, um, when I said of the National Assessment Staff, um, I hadn't been to America before. This is the mid-70s. Uh, I go to the agency and um, I'm briefed by, uh, and I can't do deep South accents, <laughs> do, but I'll try. And this uh, CIA character said to me, sir, I'm going to brief you on the Soviet SS-18 intercontinental ballistic missile. Mod 2 with 10 independently targeted re-entry vehicles, sir. And he knew about every rivet. We looked at the, from the overhead satellites, the 
the silos and the refueling and the warheads being separately guarded by the KGB and so on. But he knew bugger all about submarine uh, ballistic missiles and ask him about tanks or something, not his scene. And I have to say, when I had current intelligence crises on my hands uh, in the 70s, um, you know, I could bring up an expert here who was an expert on the Politburo and the Communist Party, but who knew nothing about the Soviet military. I could bring up the expert on the Soviet military, he couldn't tell me about the economy. I could bring the expert up on Soviet agriculture, but he couldn't tell me about heavy industry. And that was the case in both academia and intelligence, and especially in the United States, but to a significant extent here. You had to drill down uh, uh, to be noticed. The danger was there was little in the way of overarching views. Uh, there were academics in the US, like um, uh, Professor Biala from, uh, Sorin Biala from uh, Colombia, who, who chanced his arm uh, uh, with more overarching books. The second one is, you know, the, the familiar one of mirror imaging. You know, the, the Soviets are going to be just like us, they will react to international crises like us. Um, why, you know, why don't they understand more that, I think it was Reagan who said, uh, uh, just before Reykjavik um, in 86, no, it wasn't, it was in 83, in the nuclear war scare. Reagan said, um, and I've just been rereading re it in one of these two books, I'll show you. Reagan said in 86, why are the Soviets thinking we're going to attack them with a preemptive disarming nuclear strike? We Americans are so moral. <laughs> yes, right. There is, and this is a familiar theme, and for those of us who come from Anglo-Saxon countries, and don't get me wrong on that, I don't mean that in a, a racial way, I mean um, countries like Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and in many ways to a significant extent uh, the United States of <coughs> Anglo-Saxon origin, have no common land borders, and they don't understand countries that have been invaded across common land borders. And they're going to tell me that America has a border with Canada, who cares? And one with Mexico, who cares? Uh, I think it's very different. I think it's very different when you have a common land border. Let me give you a little example that is current. As you know, uh, the Baltic Republics are now separate countries, and um, NATO, they're all members of NATO. If you take the most northern one, uh, Estonia, it has um, NATO F-16 fighters there. Um, the distance from that fighter base to uh, St. Petersburg is the distance from Kuma to Canberra. And I can tell you as a former defence planner, if we had Indonesian fighters in Kuma, it would focus our minds. Because we're not used to situations where we have common borders. So, mirror imaging. The third one is, was technological obsession, particularly in the United States, particularly in the intelligence community. They had very impressive satellite photography, intercept, and other capabilities that we were highly privy to. Not least, and I'll be careful what I say, because the um, Joint American-Australian Intelligence Collection facilities in the centre of Australia were amongst the most powerful in the world and were central to early warning for America of the liftoff of ICBMs in Siberia, or from submarine launch ballistic missiles, to give the Americans about 20 minutes warning time. And I was centrally involved in those facilities. Um, and when we went to America to discuss those facilities, we would see the director of CIA, the director of DIA, um, the, um, the director of NSA, the deputy director of defense, and the deputy secretary state. This was long before the days of Osmin. It's one of the days we as senior intelligence officers and public servants ran the policy. I, I mention it not, you know, to beat up my own position, but to just show you the enormous influence we had in the Cold War and how crucial we were to the American, um, what we thought was nuclear deterrence of the United States, of the Soviet Union. The, techn not, the technical obsessions were taken to extremes in which, you know, I would be told by American colleagues that a particular Soviet submarine, the Akula, which was a titanium 40 knot submerged submarine, that the Americans couldn't trace it, couldn't track it. Rubbish. We were told that the T-72 tank was so strong in its lead armor that no NATO 
anti-tank missile could penetrate it. Rubbish. The Israelis did it in the Bekar Valley, um, uh, whatever that was in the 80s. We were told, and Hugh White will recall this, in the fancy products that um, American intelligence publicly produced, that the Soviets were developing a charged particle beam weapon, a uh, X-ray device into space that would bring down ICBMs. Well, we still ain't found it. We still haven't found it, but it was a central part of American calculations. So, technological obsession. And for reasons you would understand, and I'm not critical of, little in the way of human intelligence operatives penetrating uh, you know, the Soviet Union. I waited in vain to see you know, the covert message from the American spy in the Politburo. Never saw that. Never saw anything like that. Not that we would have seen everything. There was, there was also, fourthly, to be more fair, views of Soviet strengths that I mentioned out of Kissinger in the late 70s and early 80s, where it looked as though, to use a then Soviet expression, that the correlation of world forces was moving in favor of the Soviet Union. The defeat of America in Vietnam, Russia's movement into Afghanistan with no reaction from the West, and Russia's build up in the Indian Ocean and indeed the North Pacific, and you remember Angola and, of course, uh, the Caribbean, uh, and with the Iron Fist over Eastern Europe. There was a real impression that the correlation had moved decisively in favor of uh, Soviet military strength and global power. And finally, it was is the one that, for me, was most oppressive, and that was conforming with the conventional wisdom. You heard what happened to my uh, chances of being promoted uh, um, because somebody uh, in a very senior position but who was not in the Department of Defense uh, couldn't stand my views of the Soviet Union. It went further than that on occasions. Um, the very fact you visited there, even though it was with um, official endorsement as an intelligence officer, brought about all sorts of suspicions. I think in the academic world, um, Certainly in Australia, there was not that sort of pressure, but there was pressure. And there was also the, pr the, the pressure of professional groupthink. That, you know, we had such um, imperfect knowledge. You remember how difficult a target it was. And how dare one be a lone figure and say, you know, it's all going to come to an end. And of course, none of us did. Certainly in the intelligence communities, there was enormous threatening pressure to conform. I'm going to move on now. I'm going to just very briefly talk about two case studies of the dangers of American miscalculations of the Soviet threat. The first one you'll recall was 1983 and the Soviet nuclear war scare. And the second one is 1986 and Reykjavik. And there's a book here which I commend to you called The Dead Hand by David Hoffman, journalist in the Washington Post. It was posted to Moscow in the late 80s, early 90s, it is a brilliant book with access to information that even I um, don't remember seeing. And you know, a lot of the archives both in America and in the immediate fall of the Soviet Union, but not now, were open. So let's just briefly talk, 83. Remember I said, much more serious than Cuba. It starts off in early 83 with the brawl over intermediate range nuclear missiles. The Soviets for some years have been deploying very threatening <coughs> SS-20 intermediate range nuclear missiles, not strategic, but from bases in Western Russia were capable of taking out London and Paris. So these were not short range things. And they had multiple warheads and were very accurate. The Americans responded by developing the Pershing II, which was a Mark 8, can't look out what Mark 8 is, but uh, quick. Big number, four. Uh, big number <laughs> 5,000 miles an hour or something like that. Um, uh, supersonic cruise missile. It's warning time from bases in West Germany to the Soviet leadership was between four and six minutes. In other words, a, de a, de a decapitating strike. And that's how the Soviets saw it. I'm not, in this discussion of 83, I am not excusing the Soviets. I'm aware of what a nasty regime and how they've built up very threatening nuclear capabilities against Europe, the SS-20s and other things. What I didn't know until I learned it from this book, and I've not seen it contradicted, if somebody thinks what I'm about to say is wrong, please tell me, 
The American Secretary of Navy, John Lehman, who was a rather right wing, decided that the Soviets need to be taught just how powerful American naval power was. So in uh, the spring of 83, Northern Hemisphere spring, they deployed three aircraft carrier battle groups off the coast of Kamchatka. One of those, and they were practicing, you know, um, operations and trying to trigger off by getting so close to the Soviet borders that you trigger off the Soviet radars and intercepts and then you can actually, thank you, that's brilliant, we've now got your radar signature and we know what transmission you're using for intercepts. He then detached the Midway aircraft carrier, it went on to electronic close down, uh, the, the Russians, the Soviets lost it, and they then uh, allegedly unauthorised flew four F-14s off the aircraft carrier and penetrated Soviet territory in the Kurov Islands. That autumn, a Korean airliner left the United States, KAL-007, a great number, flew over its navigation system with an intact GPS in those days, it was in serious error, it flew over Kamchatka. The Petropavlovsk in Kamchatka was the main ballistic missile firing site in the place. It then flew over the Sea of Okhotsk, untouched. And then it flew over Sakhalin, and a Soviet fighter pilot brought it down with 200 civilian on board, including a Republican member of Congress. There had been an incident, which I forgot to mention earlier on, with the German pilot who flew a light aircraft and landed it in Red Square. Now, I've gone and forgotten his name. But that was another issue. And of course, you can imagine the Soviets were under severe instructions don't ever let that happen again. But you can imagine the outcry. What is not in this book, and what I remember as an intelligence officer only too well, that was 1983. 1978, I recall, a Korean airliner leaves London for Seoul, going over the North Pole. It goes to the North Pole. It comes back down over uh, Soviet territory uh, between Finland and um, uh, Achenkaus, Archangel, where the major <coughs> Soviet ballistic missile firing base at um, uh, submarine ballistic missile firing base at Soviet Divinsky. The Soviet fighters then ordered the plane down and it landed. I'm not saying the two are connected, but if you're a Soviet, you may well have thought that. So all this was going on. And drop off the former head of the KGB was General Secretary of the Party, an obsessive man, uh, um, hated the West, believed the West was developing a decapitating, disarming first strike to decapitate the leadership of the Persian tours and so on. He ordered the KGB resi residents in uh, London and Washington to go on high alert to detect telltales of shortened warning time for uh, nuclear attack. When all this was going on, we're now talking October, <coughs> just after the events with the Korean airliner, NATO launches a huge military exercise, bigger than anything they've done before, called the Exercise Able Archer, which goes all the way up to the release of, simulated release of nuclear weapons. You know, a Soviet conventional strike across the full the gap and use of tactical and then and Dropov goes right off the edge and believes that it's about to happen. This happened in 83. I learned about it as Director of Defence Intelligence in 1987 with the just retired Director of Defence Intelligence Agency and the serving CIA National Intelligence Officer uh, who had served here. Gone Paul says the uh, Gon says the, uh, the CIA worked together and tell Paul about why I'm in 83, so the titles. Um, what would, the first warning we would have get, gotten in a nuclear war would have been two dropped on the, well, three, Pine Jack and Runner and Northwest Cape. Um, it was our view, it's certainly my view, we saw advised Malcolm Fraser in the late 70s that in a final spasm of nuclear exchange, most likely Sydney and maybe another city would be hit because we were so close to the Americans. And the Soviets knew from traitors in the American establishment at TRW who revealed part of the secrets of the operations of Pine Gap. So they knew what the hell we were up to. 
I was told by these two Americans in, uh, uh, when I, in 1988 that one of the other telltales was that the group of Soviet forces in East Germany, um, Sukhoi, 15s or 16s, I forget, uh, were for the first time lo loading tactical nuclear weapons on board the aircraft and ready to go with one minute's notice. So when anybody tells me Cuba was it, if you'll forgive my use of a well-known academic expression, bullshit. No, absolute bullshit. And I commend that you read books on this. You can go up to the CIA history site and you can read about it. You can read Robert Gates's book, From the Shadows, How I Served Six Presidents, and you'll see he's got a chapter, 1983, The Most Dangerous Year. Oh, thanks, Robert. We never had a tell. 1986, three years later, regularly. By now, unlike 83, Gorbachev has been in power since March 85. To be fair, and I find it hard to be fair with Reagan, Reagan was questioning mutual assured destruction, the use of nuclear weapons. And as you well know, he struck on the idea with help from people like Richard Pearl and, and um, Richard Pipes, the idea of Star Wars, <coughs> ballistic missile defense. The Russians took it seriously, in my view, far too seriously. But they knew that American technology was better than theirs, and the gap, as their economy slowed, was increased. So, and my great friend and colleague, Jeffrey Barker, unfortunately, is not here tonight. He was um, with the Australian, he was an Australian journalist at Reykjavik, and he can tell you what happened. It's written up in this book, two chapters. So, Reagan and Gorbachev negotiate. And this was Gorbachev's proposal. Phase one, this is 1986. <coughs> by 1991-94, cut all strategic arsenals by 50%. So they go from 12,000 to 6,000. You've still got a lot. Phase two, between 1995 and 1997, continue the reductions and eliminate all tactical nuclear weapons. If they still not occurred, the Soviet Union may have 30,000 tactical nuclear weapons. Phase three, by the year 2000, says Gorbachev, we'll get rid of all nuclear weapons. And we know he was fair dinkum about this, because uh, uh, General Akramayev, the chief of uh, general staff, had done the figures under Gorbachev's instructions. Reagan was very tempted until one Richard Pearl, the Prince of Darkness, <laughs> whispered in his ear and said, and there was one story point, not the 50%, and not eventually the other, but the stalling point was Gorbachev had written into the, uh, the draft treaty that with regard to Star Wars, the Americans would keep it at the laboratory level, would not test and deploy. And Reagan asked the advice of Richard Pearl, and Richard Pearl said that is simply not acceptable. And my friend Jeffrey Barker said he was there when uh, George Shultz came out of these harrowing long overnight meetings deathly white and looked at the assembled journalists, including Jeffrey Bach, and said, we got so close and we failed. And you know, you've got to ask yourself, it was natural that people like Robert Gates and others were very suspicious of Gorbachev, but they missed it, you see. Think about where we would be with nuclear weapons if this had been cemented as, a, as an agreement. Gareth Evans, for one, would be very happy. <laughs> and where is ballistic missile defense? Oh, I know. Maybe you can bring down two or three or six, but sure as hell not 12,000. So there we are. That's my story on that. Okay. There's another book that I commend, only two, by Stephen uh, uh, Kotkin. He is a professor of modern history at Princeton. It's called Armageddon Averted. You can read it, it's not very big. It's not like this one, which is size. It's really good thing. He asked a very good question. You know, why was it that the military didn't press the buttons, lash out at the West? Why was it that there wasn't a military uprising in Turkey? Well, there was in August 91, but it was a pathetic example. If you look at the videos of it, it was ham-fisted and not professional at all. I sometimes ask myself these counterfactuals, you know, what would have happened if the military coup in August 91 headed by military and KGB people, as it was, 
succeeded. I asked myself, what would have happened if Andropov had lived a lot longer? Um, and Gorbachev only made it as, you know, Politburo member. My personal view is that we still don't know <coughs> how Armageddon was averted and what sort of bloodshed it would have involved, both internally and potentially externally. It's a counterfactual worth asking. I guess more seriously, my personal view is that rather than the sudden collapse, if Gorbachev had not unleashed the powers that he didn't understand, the Soviet Union could have gone into a long, drawn out decline. That's just as rational an explanation as the sudden collapse one. My friend Bill Odom, who was uh, head of the National Security Agency, a fluent Russian linguist, and who, before he died, wrote a, a magnificent book for Yale University called the, uh, the Collapse of the Soviet Military. It's a fantastic book. Uh, he says in the book, the Soviet Union could have gone on for years, if not decades, in a period of slow decline. So I think these are issues that, you know, certainly I ask myself, and they're important. I could go on longer, but I won't. I just want to very briefly, and let me stress, those of you who want to ask me questions about current Russia, I'm not across it in the way I used to be. Most of my working days are spent in Australian defense policy these days. What about Russia 20 years on? You know today is the 7th of November. Hands up those who understand the importance of that date in the Russian calendar. Revolution. Exactly. It's, today is the 94th anniversary of the great October Bolshevik Revolution. Why October? They use the Julian calendar, which is 13 days behind ours. Russian Christmas, Day, Russian Christmas Day is still the 7th of January. So it was just by chance that when Garth uh, organized a date, I grabbed hold of this because it has certain import. So 20 years on this December. Well, what has happened? Is it better or worse? Um, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was all this outpouring of expectations that it would be a democracy, or it ain't, is it? Um, that it would join NATO, or it hasn't, has it? It is alleged that the Americans under George W. Bush reassured Gorbachev that when East Germany was incorporated into West Germany, that would be the end of the expansion of NATO. Well, it hasn't been. NATO is the Baltic Republic's. Huh? On the, on the doorstep. I do hope that NATO doesn't go ahead, and I presume they won't, with this silly and dangerous idea of incorporating the Ukraine into NATO. If you want Russia to reach for armed force, do that. I'm sorry about Ukrainians, but I'm talking about politics. If you look at after 20 years where Russian politics and democracy is, and compare it with, with Indonesia in a much shorter time span since 1998, we have the elements of a blossoming democracy, Indonesian style, uh, and freedom of press, Indonesian style, in Indonesia. And Russia is nowhere near it. Indeed, you want my personal views, and I you know, stand corrected on this. I think there is a deep-seated, authoritarian, national political culture in Russia and that they will not get to democracy. About 700 years ago, <coughs> the Tsars and Communist dictators asked me if I think Russia is a safer place. I'm supposed to go there later this month. Uh, um, in the Soviet period, as long as you weren't doing silly things as an intelligence person, you were okay. Now, if you're in the wrong restaurant at the wrong time, uh, <laughs> life can be very short. Finally, as you foreshadow, two contemporary questions about the consequences of the Soviet collapse. Two geopolitical questions or issues. The first one is, I put it to you, that the collapse of the Soviet Union, as quick and surprising and unpredictable as it was, brought about a very considerable dimension of American hubris. That their great enemy, of 45, 50 years did a quiet disappearing to sleep without 
using armed force. And you remember all that talk, silly talk, Francis Fukuyama, this is the end of world history. Liberal, you know, capitalist democracy will win. Well, right now, liberal capitalist democracies are in some trouble. Political leaderships in this country, Japan, America, and many southern European countries, and economies in Japan, the United States, and many European countries. I'm not saying there's a crisis of capitalism, but I'm saying there is an issue of where, how did we get, who, who would believe 20 years after the end of the Cold War and the existential threat of global nuclear war, we're now in this situation. I think for the Americans, they were the nervous of the Russians in it, they refused basically, there was no Marshall Plan to help uh, the former Soviet Union, none at all. They wanted to see Russia reduced for all time. And look, I think many Europeans are of that view, and I understand that if you share common borders and so on. But, you know, we'll reap, I think, the, uh, the negative aspects of this. Uh, they sent, the Americans sent cowboy, extreme uh, uh, economic cowboys, uh, to, you know, to teach um, the worst aspects of capitalism without controls. I think, you know, America, the New World Order, the end of history, felt it could move into Iraq but without charge, which it did, and on the basis, as we all know, specious basis of um, uh, weapons of mass destruction. So I think there is an issue that, dare one say it, were the Americans more disciplined when there was a nasty power like the Soviet Union? Man? It's been a bit naughty. The second one is something that Hugh White and I have discussed, and that is, are the dangers just like the former Soviet Union of straight line extrapolations with regard to the Chinese military threat? And those of you who came to my previous public lecture two months ago will know that uh, I am one of those, and Pew and I don't always agree on this, uh, who believe that China is nowhere near the military power of the Soviet Union. Hugh accepts that. Hugh says China's got uh, significant other power, soft power, and that's true. I am yet to see real areas of Chinese military innovation. It still depends very heavily on Russian technology uh, for its military power. It is true it is developing capabilities that are cyber warfare and allegedly anti-carrier ballistic missiles. But here we have a country, China, that has never fought a modern war, never fought a modern war at all. Has no experience of joint warfare fighting. Um, you know, um, but remember the former Soviet Union had all that experience. It defeated the greatest army the world has ever seen. It was German. So, you know, there are these dangers of straight line extrapolation. So I close on two notes. But the end of the Soviet Union encouraged American hubris geopolitically in places like um, Iraq. And overextension economically, and hence one of the current problems. It would not have done all those things when the Soviet Union was around, because of the real discipline, including about proving economically you were a viable, sustainable state. And then this issue of Let's not fall, fall into the same dangers as with the former Soviet Union of straight line extrapolations and China military threat. And he was reminding me, coming back to those other points about, you know, um, uh, conformity. Remember the pressures on people like me to conform with the Americans about the Soviet uh, military threat. Are we now seeing conformity with regard to the assessment on China, which is eternally optimistic, optimistic, and optimistic? And on that note, thank you. Uh, to uh, study the problems that you're talking about internally in the Soviet Union. Are you aware of that? And if so, how did that influence Gorbachev's eventual decision-making with respect to... Well, I mean, we do know that, that uh, um, Gorbachev was Andropov's personal choice. And you've got to remember, when I was tracking Gorbachev, he was... Um, he grew up uh, in the Northern Caucasus, the Kuban area. Uh, his parents were... Uh, 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 collective farmers, uh, very committed uh, to the collective. Um, he grew up in the party in the North Caucasus, became first secretary of the um, uh, Northern Caucasus uh, Oblast. And it was all agriculture. By the way, he had no experience in parts of Russia that were not Russian. Hence, in my view, his inability to understand what was about to happen in uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and indeed Ukraine. Um, 
So look, I think there was that um, situation, but you know, Andropov was quickly extremely ill and very frail. And um, the very fact that they chose somebody as young and different when we'd seen you know, Brezhnev, Chernyanka, and Dropov in a matter of three years, I think it was. Senile, doddering, you know, times. So we shouldn't underestimate Andropov's role in, in the recruitment. Whether Gorbachev understood precisely what he was doing with um, perestroika and glasnost, he, we know he didn't want to see the end of the Soviet state and communism and the ruling power of the party. But I think once he started to tinker with it, and given that there was this view of the immorality of the system, you know, I mean, you know those sort of trite quotations you got in the period um, out of the Soviet, you know, chit-chat. Um, uh, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. The, um, the rhyme that they had about um, the two major newspapers, Pravda, the party paper, and Zvestia, the government paper. Pravda means the truth, Zvestia means the news. And the rhyming couplet was, there's no truth in the news, no news in the truth. It, it told you the cynical wellsprings that once they were tapped, the dam opened, and Gorbachev didn't know what the hell was happening. Ambassador. Thank you so much, Paul. That's really fascinating. There's so many questions you could ask. When I listened to you, it was so interesting to hear that when you talked about the uh, situation, why the situation was so bad and so close to a nuclear configuration, that you had the feeling that, though coming from a very close ally of the United States, you somehow seemed to blame both sides as much. But we both agreed that Soviet Union was an evil empire. Yeah. But still, the obsession from the American side and their sometimes stupid way of reacting mm. give me the impression that you almost dispute the blame equally between the two parties. Is this correct, Mr. Well, if you'd have asked me that question in 1983, I wouldn't have dared sort of be you know, <laughs> conformity. I think sometimes our American cousins, as you know, we're the closest ally of America other than the United Kingdom. We share intelligence, but no other country. Um, you know, sweeping generalisation. They ain't good on other countries and cultures. You know, America is a world complete unto itself, isn't it? 300 million people, world's biggest economy. What did Dick Cheney once tell me? 60% of American senators did not carry a passport. You know, who wants to go to these funny places like Austria? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I think, wittingly or unwittingly, the Americans did some blundering things. I don't object to the Pershing twos, the, the Soviets brought that on themselves with the SS-20s, but you remember the three aircraft carrier battle groups, you know, flying across Soviet, and I forgot to mention, when that Korean airline was doing its thing, the very same day, a KC-135 American spy plane was operating over Kamchat, well, very close to the, 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 the Soviet borders near Kamchat. No excuse for the Soviet to shot down the airline, of course not. But the answer to your question is yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ah. It's most interesting. Uh, why did we get the collapse of the USSR so wrong? Because the West didn't want the USSR to collapse. <laughs> <laughs> why? I think there are two main reasons in my view. First of all, because of the fear and because of the dramatic experiences of the two world war. Yes. Uh, misplaced respect meant what you outlined, that the focus was on technical obsession and uh, numbers of Sovietologists which would read out the USSR politics by saying who stood where during the first May parade. There was no voice given to dissidents. There was no voice given to European communities or other communities who found themselves out of the USSR, who were simply ignored as being anti-communist. Yeah. And culturally, in the West, it was, in fact, one of the 
politically correct thing to support the Soviet Union, not perhaps in its totality, but in some selective areas. That is, if anything was shown as positive, it was absolutely uh, applauded by the whole of the West. It was enough for Andropov to like whiskey. <laughs> everybody was cheering up that perhaps there would be some reforms in the USSR. I'm not saying by this that uh, my country knew that the collapse of the USSR would go that fast, but at least we wished it to <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. So you've heard comments from the ambassador of Sweden and the ambassador of Poland, and you see, they're the people who have got the interest in this. They have to, you know, I mean, you know, other ambassadors probably can't find Russia on the map. <laughs> thank you for that, Andre, uh, as usual. And um, I just want to say to you, on Friday night, uh, um, I watched this film called Katyn uh, by uh, that Polish uh, director. What is that? How you pronounce it? Andrzej Wajda. Wajda, okay. I commend it to you. It is a superb thing about this so Soviet massacre of 15,000 Polish officers, and they blamed it on the Nazis. Yeah. Uh, Tom Worthington from the Computer Science Department. I'm not an ambassador to anywhere. <laughs> um, In which case, I shall hang about. Hang about. <laughs> <laughs> Now that we, we know this, how should we train our people in Australia? Yeah. Not, particularly as the ANU is going to be training some of them, how should we do it differently so that they will not make the same yeah. mistakes? That is a fabulously good question. I'm not sure I've got a smart answer, but I think, you know, it is of serious concern in this country that. We all know, you know, the shifting of the other balance of power to, to, to Asia, the stuff that we like today, and the rise of China. Um, and that there are other people in this room who know that the figures for people who are learning a national language in Australian schools and universities, including Mandarin, uh, Japanese, and Indonesian, are declining, and declining quite rapidly. Uh, and yet in America they're not, and I understand even in the UK they're not. And so I think the issue of um, I was never very good at languages, there's some issue there, but I get a, when I drink vodka, my Russian is <laughs> bugger the ground. Um, that um, we need to encourage in our part of the world, our region, that we have experts who know the languages, know the culture, you know, read the poetry, listen to the music. I mean, you know, to me it was, you know, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, you know, the Tolstoy, Turgenev, um, Russian ballet, it, unless you get into that, you don't get it under your fingernails. You don't smell it. And it disturbs me greatly we've got these adverse trends, not least with language and culture. And this university, as, as Paul Kutchkoff knows, we're, we're doing that bit. But there's the other issue of, I know that, you know, you've got to be specialised, that PhDs have to be, you know, a particular cut, a finite cut. The great lesson I learned from the Soviet Union was, including the academic community here, was, we, they were all studying more and more about less and less. Remember, they couldn't talk to me, if they're an expert on the Politburo, they couldn't talk to me about the Soviet military. And the Soviet military person couldn't talk to me about the economy. And that used to frustrate the hell out of me when I had a, a, a current intelligence crisis on my shoulders. And I think it did lead to people not wanting to chance their arm on the overarching picture. And I know, you know, as a rigorous scholar, we've got to be careful not to have, you know, broad brush not rigorous analysis, but I think certainly on the China issue, I want to see more academics, and indeed others, telling me what are the weaknesses of China as well as the strengths. Don't tell me everything is perfect, and it's going to grow forever, and it's, you know, military power will be, you know, this, that, and the other. We need more challenges, and we should encourage our students um, to not conform. It's not a brilliant answer, but it's best I've got. Yeah. Uh, I recall, Paul, that you got enormously frustrated over the delays with publishing your book. I think yeah. you sort of delayed something like 18 months. Yeah. Was that due to 
incompetence on the part of the publisher, or was there something happening behind the scenes? Good question. I don't, even with my black view of the world and suspicions, um, we forget in this instant self-publishing age that, you know, camera-ready copy. I mean, the way I wrote that book uh, in the Coombs building was I had two desks, because I'm a very typey person. I'd say to my research assistant, chapter one, on whatever subject. She'd bring the books and the journals and so on on one desk, and I'd have pen, you know, approach it, and somebody would type it up, and then we'd take all that away, and we'd do ta chapter two. All of which got Andy Mack, who was not a tidy person, really sort of going. Um, so, the business of printing it up and then going to Galley Proofs and then coming back, the Macmillan's Press, who were publishing for um, the double I double S, challenged the title, the song, in, in the incomplete superpower, which I thought was a great sexy title. And they wanted to call it The Limits to Soviet Power. And I was able to point out there were lots of other books around The Limits to, you know, things. So, I just think Macmillan's were extremely slow, you know, British publisher, and um, it took 18 months. And they, they did a slow, the, the, the cover design was awful. Um, they did a limited print run, so it was published in 86. In 87, they did a reprint. And then they asked me in 88 to do a second version. I'm working full time for Kim Beasley on Australian defense policy. And, all I did was write a couple of pages about Gorbachev. It really wasn't the second edition at all, you know. But no, I don't think there was any subterranean plot. But I meant it when I said that if Bob O'Neill, the Australian, the first and only Australian director of the IISS in London, had not been director, would anybody of else other than Bob stuck their neck out, not only write a foreword, but publish the damn thing? Because when you read it now, it's a fairly anodyne, innocuous thing. It says, hey, there's some problems here. But as you heard me say, um, there's certain people like Robert Gates, Deputy Director of CIA, and the Director General of ONA, whose name I've given you, had, had other views. And saw it as, you know, um, very threatening. Yeah. This might be a slightly I mean, I think now, by the way, and you may have read a piece in the um, perspective section of the Financial Review on Friday last week uh, uh, by Nicholas Eberhardt or some such, yeah, yeah. about the demographic problems uh, in the Soviet Union, which are si in Russia, which are serious. They're going down from 147 million to 120. Um, the health system, he alleges now, is very poor. He alleges, and I don't know how, that the education system is not good. It is true that, you heard me say, unless you were a political dissident, uh, like Solzhenitsyn, um, as long as you kept your nose clean politically, the educational system, particularly in the hard sciences, was first rate. It produced world-class mathematicians, engineers, scientists. I understand that's not the case now. What I meant by third world was, I would sit here in the intelligence community and I'd look at these overhead satellite photographs of SS-18 ballistic missiles in some Siberian silo or the latest tank or whatever. And, you know, the American pressure was, just look at that, that's better than anything we've got, which of course was untrue. And then I'd fly to the Soviet Union, I'd go to Singapore, and I'd climb in Aeroflot, which Ambassador, we used to call it Avtobos flop. Yeah. Um, very poor um, engines, they still make very poor rate of wear military engines and civil engines. That's what the Chinese have got. And you go to Moscow and you find queues everywhere for the most simple of products. This is in the early 80s. I once joined, it, it was my habit to join queues. I think it was a good way of collecting information. What the hell was really going on? You have all the party propaganda about, you know, Lenin is our helmsman and so on. He 
exhorting the workers to, to, to high levels of productivity. And join these queues. I once joined a queue with a full colonel from the tank regiment with the black tabs. And he said to me in Russian, you know, um, would you hold my place here? We were queuing, I said, so what we're queuing for? He said, um, we're queuing for uh, oranges from Algeria. And there were, there were the equivalents in the early 80s of $30 Australian a kilo. I mean, only the elite-ish. People certainly were not, you know, in the top bracket, but who were people like him who didn't go to the party shops could afford these things. And the other queue he was jo joining was for some bananas out of Africa. And you'd go, as I did in, uh, in 68, I was one of the first Australians ever to go to um, from Moscow uh, to uh, Novosibirsk, to Academic City, Akatiyam Gorodok, um, to um, Irkutsk on Lake Baikal, to Bratsk, which was the world's biggest hydro station, and to Havarosk. And you know, in the villages, it was 19th century Russia. And I have not been to uh, rural Russia. Um, I've been to towns like uh, Pskov and Novgorod. Uh, but um, uh, I'm aiming next year, as we develop our relationships at the AMU with, with Russia, um, to see just what the life is like in the village areas. To me, I don't say this happily, if, if, their, if their education and health system have degraded as much as the article I mentioned on Friday uh, claims, then that is, to say the least, an additional sadness for a, a magnificent culture. You know, you've heard me say Russian poetry, Russian literature, Russian music, Russian ballet, I mean, is absolutely magnificent. But they have had a history that is profoundly sad. I mean, let me quickly just remind you. You know, as Russian Christianity was developing, guess where, in Kiev, where is it, Ukraine, and where the, map, the, the Cyrillic alphabet has been developed, where, in Kiev, Ukraine. Just as that's getting off the ground and starting to form principalities and so on, uh, the Mongol hordes come across and occupy them for 250 years. 250 years. Longer than America has been a nation state, I think. Is that right? And, you know, the high cheekbones, but more importantly, the, um, the acknowledgement of the knot and domination, um, uh, I think, taught them bad habits. You had all those succession of czars from Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, through. Um, you had them, the ambassadors gone, occupied by Sweden at the Battle of Poltava, 1700 and something. Where's Poltava? In the Ukraine. Then you had Napoleon. Hmm? Burnt down Moscow, got defeated, then you had Hitler. Um, it is an extremely sad and poor history. You know, again, I used to have to argue with the Office of National Assessments here. The figures were that the Russians lost 20 million in the Second World War. Rubbish, says the Director General of ONA. That's just Soviet propaganda. Well, the real figure now is 29 million dead. Can you think about that figure? Can any of us, you know? In any major battle in the Second World War, the Soviets lost 500,000 troops. Sure, it was a nasty, oppressive, evil regime. But I think, you know, you look at the collective history of this country, and now, you know, 20 years on from the Great Promise, where the hell is it? Not in a good state, in my view. I say that with no job. Uh, Professor, in the title of your talk, and, and many times we hear the comment, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, yeah. As if it were comparable to the collapse of the Roman Empire, is it not the case that um, Russia, you know, the, the major component of that empire, is still a massive potential power in both economic and uh, in political terms, and with its huge landmass and the resources it come with it, that it, uh, there's a chance we've overstated the significance of the collapse of the Soviet Union yeah. because of what remains mm. potentially. Well, I mean, you know. The Tsar of all the Russias, Putin, that's what he is, um, talks about this was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. I think that's a very heartfelt Russian thing. I mean, right, the heartland of Russia survives. It's a huge landmass. I mean, Siberia is more than twice as large as Australia alone. But the depopulation of Russia, remember I've mentioned the demographic problem. I mean, it's caused by alcoholism, poor health, um, and other things. Uh, it is a significantly contracting population, down from 147 to 120 something other. And the 
I nearly said the Soviet Far East. Mm -hmm. The Russian Far East has dropped two million from eight million to six, and yet it shares a common border with, in the northern provinces of China, 140 million. If Australia, a sparsely populated, resource-rich country like Siberia, had a common border with China with that sort of population, I can tell you what our defence plan would be. There's a one. Entirely different. Um, I've only written one academic piece since the collapse of well, the Soviet Union, collapse of the system, which is accurate. Um, because, you know, the last 20 years I've been doing Australian defence policy and regional security, and I wrote a piece for a moderately right-wing American journal called The American Interest, not The National Interest, and it was called The Bear is Back. And look, I think there is enormous potential if they can get their act together. They are the world's largest exporter of natural gas, and from time to time the largest exporter of oil. Uh, when oil prices are high, they do really well. They do up 7 or 8%, because you know the prices have come down somewhat. They've got other vast resources, untapped resources in Siberia. They have been a highly literate, educated people with a good education service. I say, I'm no longer up to date as to whether the education system is as bad as the article I mentioned claims. So we shall see, um, but it is a big ask to turn around from where they are now, it seems to me. One last. Second last. Second, second, second. second. Okay. Um, you laid considerable amount of the blame uh, for this uh, collapse on uh, the Americans not being able to see the uh, seeing too many trees and not enough of a fire view. Um, I'm wondering, since since this was uh, a Republican um, group that was in there, and you have some remarks about right wing. Uh, views, so I'm taking it here more on the liberal side. Have you ever done a what if on what would have happened or yeah. what yeah. would things be yeah. like? I mean, what what is the difference in your view of the liberal versus conservative thing that's going on in the U.S. versus you know our public policy or our yeah. foreign policy? Yeah. Despite the fact you're our uh, best ally, you're a, you're a funny lot, you Americans. I mean. <laughs> when you and I were working in defence, uh, if you think we didn't even try to challenge what we were getting from the Americans um, and uh, make sure that what we got uh, was what we wanted, and, and we developed with Kim Beasley this very contentious policy of full knowledge and concurrence with regard to American facilities here, not American bases. When the President comes next week, there will be no announcement of bases where to use some Australian facilities. Unlike Japan, we're not going to have bases owned by American territory with American flag flying, guarded by Americans, and with no Australians allowed in. But we often say, I, Hugh said me say this, I sometimes wish that, in addition to the quaint form of English that Americans speak, that you actually spoke a foreign language, because we would actually put a lot more effort in trying to understand that in many ways you are quite different from us. You know, the light on the hill, the exceptional society, the pilgrim fathers, the world of religion, um, you know, all that stuff. It is true we share new world, big horizons and so on. I think a lot of Americans, as you know, you think we're like Texas. Well, yes and no. We have a very different history, you know? Convicts, tough, horrible country, the further inland it wasn't the wild west of California. Um, no, I haven't done the counterfactual we've mentioned. Um, I think it's a very interesting proposition, Paul. I mean, it is true that largely I lived through, you know, Republican administrations. I found people like George Schultz very reasonable. Kim Beasley, but not me, found Kat Weinberger very reasonable. <laughs> but remember, Kim's into moral Um <laughs> I found people like Richard Pearl and uh, Richard Pipes off the edge. I mean, hard right, hard right wing. I did not find Robert Gates unreasonable. We had differences, but I think, you know, the fact he served for this uh, democratic administration says something, and that's something, by the way, you can do in your country that we can't do in this country. 
We've got such surplus talent, you see, we can afford not to do that. But I think we might get our students, master's students, up at Kyle at one time, Hugh, to do a, a counterfactual along the lines you propose. Very interesting. Okay, well, let's wrap it up there. Paul, thanks very much. You've given us a real feast uh, of ideas and have teased out some terrifically interesting points in the, in the questions. Particularly interesting to hear from our European friends how some of these things feel. From, uh, from, from very close up. So look, I'd like you to all uh, join me in thanking Paul for what's really been a terrifically interesting <laughs>